Got it, folks? Thanks, David. You may not know this about me, but when I was a kid, I hiked all over these hills. I've been up and down West Twin a few times, and all over Paradise Ridge. When you're out hiking alone, it's real quiet. Well, except for the buzz of crickets in the tall grass, and the rasp of wind, uh, rubbing pine tree branches against each other. There's the chirp and caw of birds, and sometimes you'll hear an elk in the distance bugling to let each other know some darn thing or another. Come to think of it, the woods are a pretty noisy place. Sorry, folks, I'd better start again. There I was out in the ruckus of the ridgeline, up at the top of West Twin, when I heard something behind me. It sounded like a metallic clanking sound, the kind you don't expect to hear out in the woods over the din of all the birds and brush and whatnot. I checked my watch and saw it was the 22nd of July. You all know what that means, right? Oh, I thought everybody around these parts knew about the 22nd of July. Oh man, I better start at the very, very beginning. You all know this used to, area used to be called Paradise Valley, right? It was a long time ago before Moscow was a town. By the summer of 1873, word had spread back east that there was good farming and some mining to be done in the region. And folks were headed out here to make their fortunes. Some folks came for to set up homesteads and Others just plied whatever trade they had along the way to make enough money to keep moving west. One of those early folks that came out here was the notorious trapper, Big Bad Dan Hagerman. <laughs> you all know what a trapper is, right? Well, in case you don't, back in those days, there weren't too many options for when you got hungry. They didn't have big supermarkets or restaurants or locally owned and operated food trucks with a variety of fusion and ethnic treats to delight most any palate. No, you only had a few options for getting food in those days. You could grow your own food, but that was slow and you had to stay in one spot all year round to make sure the crops came up right. You could preserve some food and carry it with you, but that gets heavy. Without refrigeration, the stuff would still spoil. Hunting was what most folks did, along with trading with their neighbors for stuff they couldn't easily get themselves. Once you have some folks hunting and some folks farming, well, pretty soon you have enough people hanging around in one spot to call it a town. Every now and then, someone would come through with a wagon load of goodies and trade them with people for gold and silver or even animal pelts. That's something the trappers were good at, getting animal pelts that they could trade in for things they needed like a nice new pair of socks, or some coffee, or maybe even some hardtack to help see them through the tough times. You ever try hardtack? You make it out of flour, water, and a little salt. You mush it out onto a cookie sheet and bake it. Pull it out of the oven, dot some marks in it with a fork, and then you bake it again. By that point, it's dry and hard, and the little fork marks you made let you break it up into cracker shapes. It's not very tasty, but it will sustain you and it keeps for years and years in the right conditions. Sailing ships would go to sea with something like hardtack because they were away from the nearest Wendy's by a few thousand miles and something like 500 years. <laughs> <clears throat> well, among trappers, there were some who make a name for themselves. One of those that came to Paradise Valley that summer long ago was Dan Hagerman. Folks called him Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man because he liked to shout at them just about that. He'd like to shout that at just about anyone he'd meet. He'd roll into town and with his big booming voice announce, I'm Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man. Ain't nobody can trap better than me. Well, that was definitely truth in advertising. Dan was a big guy at near six and a half feet tall. He was stocky and had a big crow's nest of black hair and an ill-kempt beard on his face. You can imagine that folks gave him a wide berth. Thing is, he wasn't lying. He really was Big Bad Dan, just not quite how he imagined himself to be. You see, Dan was a terrible trapper. I don't mean he was fearsome. I mean in the other sense of the word, as in not being good at something. <laughs> oh, sure, he was big and strong and had a long line of fearsome traps that he'd lay out for unsuspecting animals. But the guy was miserable at his job. He made so much noise and had no patience for trapping that he scared off any animal that might have come within 50 feet of one of his clunky old traps. 
folks said, he put out his biggest, meanest traps, and the squirrels would run right up and steal the bait right off of them because they were so light, they wouldn't push down the trigger. He put a line of bear traps in the middle of winter and come back later, empty traps, because the bears hibernated right through the season. <laughs> With every setback, Dan would get madder and madder and start hollering. I'm Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man. Ain't nobody can trap better than me. All this time, Dan was getting hungrier and hungrier because without pelts, he wasn't able to trade for the things he needed. Soon enough, he'd come into town all red-eyed and wild-looking and shout, I'm Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man. Ain't nobody can trap better than me. I set my lines and bide my time, and I'll eat anything I see. Can imagine that folks steered clear of this guy what with all the shouting boy that last part sounded kind of ominous there was only one guy who would talk to Dan. this was in the early fall of 73 here in paradise valley his name was yuri shostakovich he was a trader that came through this area pretty regularly uh, yuri told him dan my friend you should be thinking up new line of work why not to be going to lewiston it's good work there. My brother Dimitri helped you out. But Dan wouldn't listen and grumbled, and with a few scraps of hardtack he could afford, he headed back up into the hills to try and make his fortune as a trapper. Well, I'm sorry to say this isn't a very nice story. The West was a rough place, and bullheaded folks who didn't know when to listen to good advice often came to a bad end out here. Trapping is hard, hungry work, a big guy like Dan needed a lot of food to keep him going. He'd go out every day from his shack up near the ridge down slope of West Twin and check his trap lines. Empty again. You've probably worked hard for something, and when it didn't work out, what did you do? Looking around, I see a lot of good boys and girls and mamas and papas, too. I bet you got real frustrated, but then you'd heave a big sigh, stick out your chin and grit your teeth, and try, try again. Not Dan. Oh, no. He was Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man, and he didn't handle setbacks like you sensible folks. <laughs> He'd start ranting and raving and hooting and hollering, which did nothing but scare away the few remaining critters who hadn't already relocated over the ridge to Viola. <laughs> then he'd shout out, I'm Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man. Ain't nobody can trap better than me. I set my lines and bide my times, and I'll eat anything I see. My belly is empty and so's my line and I'm gonna punch this tree. <laughs> and he did. Wow! All Dan got for his trouble was an inky hand and some pine needles and sap in his hair. You can imagine that just made him more ornery. And so the rest of the day down in Paradise Valley, you could faintly hear some shouting, and then whack, another punched tree. Dan kept carrying on like this right into one of the hardest winters Paradise Valley had seen for a while. Did you know that on August 9th, 1897, they recorded a low of 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow, that's a cold summer. Well, winter was worse. <laughs> Things got quiet up in those hills. Come spring, no one heard any more shouting or whacking of trees. And I guess they all figured that was the end of Big Bad Dan. By 1875, when Samuel Neff registered the town's name, Big Bad Dan had been forgotten. But folks who tramp up and down the hills tell a different story. Every July was the anniversary of when Big Bad Dan had made his big dumb decision to head into the hills instead of heading down to Lewiston. I figure it preyed on his mind that he should have given up the trapping life for something else. But right around this, this time of year, folks who trek up along the ridge near West Twin swear you can hear a clanking like metal objects on a chain and a whispery voice and a whack something hitting the trees. But that sounds like foolishness. I mean, what could be up there making all that noise? Well, one summer in July, I decided to go up there and check it out for myself. It's a long, long time since the days of trappers and Russian traders in these parts. The town has a brand new name, and we have ourselves a fine university right here. No vandals. <laughs> so I didn't go hiking up there without the ascensions. I had a day pack and my good hiking boots and extra comfy socks. 
I had plenty of water and some dinosaur band-aids in case I ran into any ornery brush. <laughs> I had my trusty hiking stick, and since we can go down to the supermarket these days, I had the biggest, juiciest steak you ever did see. This was a great, big, delicious cut of prime beef, and I was going to hike a while on the ridge line. I had myself a campfire and a nice, big steak dinner. Come dusk, I was choosing a place to settle for the night, and that's when I heard it. Something above the racket of the robins and the quail and the pheasant caught my ear. I heard a whispery voice on the wind. I didn't pay it much mind, but I could have sworn someone was following me. Your mind can play tricks on you out in the woods, especially late at night. But I got the creepy crawlies up and down my spine, and you know what? I come from a long line of people who paid attention to those creepy crawlies <laughs> and let other folks wander outside and get et by a moose. <laughs> <clears throat> so I started hiking back to town. Following the ridge line, I headed west towards the setting sun. I made it a mile or two and I heard that whispery voice again. This time, heard the metallic clank. I'm not sure what it was, but I didn't want to stick around to find out, so I picked up my pace and hiked faster. I was much younger back then and could make pretty good time, especially when it was coming on dark and there were voices on the wind. <laughs> I made it nearly another mile and was out in the back hills area when I heard it clear as day. I'm Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man. Ain't nobody can trap better than me. I set my lines and bide my time, and I'll eat anything I see. My belly is empty and so's my line, and it's you I'm gonna eat. <laughs> That's it. I've had enough of spooky voices and clanking and whacking. I started running flat out and picked a bit of a rise to try and get some high ground around me. I got up to the crest of the hill with my lungs heaving and my heart thudding in my chest. I kept looking behind me to see whatever it was that was chasing me. And then I ran smack dab into someone's shed. I went whack, and my pack went thunk, and just blew its contents all over the place. My trusty walking stick broken in two. My water bottles all spilled. My nice, comfy socks ruined. I think that had more to do with my running, but still, I noticed they weren't in good shape right around this time. And worst of all, most terrible of all, that big, beautiful prime cut went thwack out of my backpack and stuck on the side of that crummy little shed. There I was. Dinner was ruined. I was soaked to the skin. And something horrible was coming up right behind me. And before my very eyes, I saw some ghostly presence peel that chunk of beef right off the side of the structure. I saw it float in midair for a moment and then vanish in three big bites. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that was too much. I'm not, a say, I'm not ashamed to say I fainted dead away. <laughs> but before my eyes fluttered shut, I swear I heard something on the wind. I'm Big Bad Dan the Trapping Man. Ain't nobody can trap better than me. I set my lines and I bide my time and I'll eat anything I see. My belly is full thanks to this darn fool. So I reckon I'll leave him be. <laughs> that, my dear friends, is the story of Big Bad Dan, the Trapping Man, and my adventure on Steak House Hill. <laughs> <laughs>